mankind. He wants mankind to, 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 to rot and burn. And the slightest infraction, that's what God wants. And that's definitely not what God wants. And we know God is a holy God, and we know that he, he deals with sin, but he's dealt with it in Christ. And if we want evidence tonight to see that God's desire is not for men to die in their sins and not to die in their iniquities, we must go to the Word. Because if we're going to put an idea out there, we must be able to Back support it, it with Scripture. It. So let's go to Ezekiel chapter 18 tonight. Ezekiel chapter 18. And we're going to read verse 31 and 32. Cast away from you all your transgressions, verse 31, whereby you have transgressed. And make you a new heart and a new spirit, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Verse 32, For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies, says the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live. Now, God is saying here in this verse that he has no pleasure in anyone who dies. I don't know why we painted that picture at all, you know. Somehow it does seem that people seem to... And, and, and I say this, there, there's somehow... Put across this picture to you that if you don't really preach to people about going to hell, that you're not really preaching the gospel. And and they purport to. I've heard and I've heard this on many programs. And Jesus did did speak about hell. And you know many preachers are quick to point out to you that he spoke more about hell than he did about else. heaven. <laughs> but we must remember a number of things. First and foremost, Jesus was born under the law. He came under the law, but he came with a purpose to fulfill the law mm -hmm. so that we then could come into the grace of God. The grace of God could not have been fully appropriated until Jesus had come and lived and died and resurrected and been accepted by his Father in heaven so that we could now come into grace. So of course he would have had to have spoken about hell. And the other reason I believe that Jesus Jesus spoke so much about it was because he wanted people to understand what he was doing so that we could escape that. But we have said, I've heard, I've been to churches before and I've heard people saying how Christians are still going to go to hell. But I, how can you be saved and still not be saved? How can you give assurance? Is that, is that what, what you call it, a conundrum? It's a conundrum. <laughs> you can't be saved and unsaved at no the way. same time. You either are in one state or the or next. Never. When no you way. were born in sin and shaped in iniquity, no matter how much righteousness you did, you could not save yourself. You could not come into heaven or go into eternal life with your good deeds. And we'll see that in another scripture in the same book of Ezekiel, but this time in chapter 33. And let's read from verse 10. Verse 10 says, Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Now we have to be very aware when we read these verses tonight of the context in which the things are being said. And, and, and it has to then fit with what we are preaching about tonight with the grace. Now therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus you speaking, saying, if our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we plain away in them, how should we then live? So if we have been saved, but our sins remain upon us, then how are we going to live? Exactly. That means no one can come to eternal life. Because you've, you're saved, but yet if you make a mistake or an error, and you are damned to hell because of that, it means to me then that we, are, we have no hope. We can't preach hope to one another. But then in verse 11 it says, Say unto them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So God is not happy when some person dies without accepting Christ. God is not happy about that. But that the wicked turn from his way and live the way of sin. He turns away from the way of sin and he comes to the way of Jesus. Turn you. Turn you from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Verse 12. Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of your people, The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turns from his wickedness. So this here would seem to suggest that the righteousness of the righteous is no righteousness. But when we come over into the New Testament, we understand why that is. Because back then under the law, you could be righteous for nine days, six days out of a week. And then on the seventh day you made a mistake, your entire week was a waste because you made that one mistake. But then we read over in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 that there is therefore now no condemnation. You hear that word, ladies and gentlemen, as we are listening to, the, to this program tonight? 
There is therefore no no condemnation for those who are what? In who Christ. are in Christ Jesus. Now the difference here is that the righteousness we have now is not our righteousness. But we are the righteousness of God in Christ. And God's righteousness is not going to run out. Right. God's righteousness is not going to come up short. It's not going to come dry in any way. So that is, the, that is the assurance that we give even tonight to those of you who may not have yet accepted Christ, that God does not want you to stay in your sins. He does not want you to stay in your sins. But here's what he says about the wicked. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall mm -hmm. thereby in the day that he turns from his wickedness. How do we turn from our wickedness? We accept, accept Jesus. Jesus. Accept what Jesus Christ has done for us. At the cross, what he did at the cross was it paid for. Well, let's put it this way: for all your wickedness, for all your wrong deeds, he took care of that. But you don't only have to accept what it is that he has done; you receive that, and you no longer have to pay for your deeds anymore. And this is the awesome truth about grace. That's an that's why he said thing. it is for sinners. You know, we, we can't put over and programs and, and make you believe it is only just for those who are already saved, but it's for those who need. To know the Savior as well, who need to know about His His um, uh, grace, Amen, and that they can accept it, Amen, and and understand that when they accept Him and they accept the offer that He has given to them of His grace, that no longer is He going to account their sins to them, no longer is He going to be attributing wickedness and all those things to them, because all of those things have been taken care of in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So the sinner needs to know that he needs the grace of God. He needs to embrace Jesus Christ. And by embracing Jesus Christ, he's embracing the love of God. Amen. Because the reality is, it is all based on the scripture again that we read in John 3.16. Mm -hmm. It is because God so loved the world. God loves us so much that he has made available to us this amazing grace. Amen. For which we are truly, truly thankful. We thank God for this amazing grace. So if you are Amen. there tonight and you have heard what we have said and you, you recognize that God wants to give, give you this grace, by all means... You can accept that grace tonight. The Bible tells us that if we would confess in our mouth and believe it in our hearts that God raised up Christ, or God has set him in place to take care of those things. We just don't have to confess it. We yes. can be saved. Amen. So right there in your own home where you are tonight, you can accept this offer of grace that God has made available to you. And you can become a believer and, and feel free. If you want to call us and let us know that you've made that decision tonight, please do so. And once again, just reminding you of the number, you can call 426-9768, 426-9768, or 426-9488, and let us know if you've made that decision for the Lord, and you really, you know, you desire to have Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You believe that He has died for your sins, and you want to accept this grace that He has made available to you. Well, going on, secondly, this evening, with the time we have left, we want to let you know that the grace, this good news, is also for believers. Oh, yes. It is for believers. The believer must understand that he is no longer under condemnation. That is good news. I Let me say something. I was a, a church now for, I said last week, I, for the time I was a little boy, I was a Christian now for many years. I wouldn't say how many years, but for many, many years. <laughs> but if there's one person who went through a lot of condemnation... <laughs> It is I. <laughs> I went through a lot of condemnation, you know. You were never thinking that you can get it right. Mm. Because it always seems as though whenever you, you know, you make 10 steps forward today, the next day you make <laughs> maybe 11 steps backwards. So you obviously <laughs> be going around in this constant circle all the time, never seeming to be getting it right. Oh, but you know yeah. what I did not understand? I did not understand fully or fully grasp until in recent years that, you know, there's no condemnation. Amen. God is not holding anything against me. In fact, when I accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, mm. his death that I accepted and his atoning work that I accepted took care of all of those matters for me. I didn't know that. Amen. And so I walked in that condemnation, always feeling that I, I, I am the one who had to get it right. I have to get it right. But when I understood that Jesus Christ is the one who already done it for me, and all I have to do is to accept mm. what it is that he has done and live in that, it made a complete change. Mm, so that's the first thing you have to understand as a believer. We're no longer under condemnation. I, I am amazed at the amount of believers that live under condemnation. It is so, so true. 
you know, I don't know if you've come across any of your time, but let me be Well, I've come me. across myself, so <laughs> I, I can speak for me as well. And I lived under much condemnation when I was growing up. I remember, you know, having given my heart to the Lord just before my teens and then remembering many occasions, you know, sometimes you go through bouts of sickness or something like that. And 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 there well, you know, you may be in your bed lying now at night and you give your heart to the Lord one more time, you know, because you figure that, you know, you made some mistakes in the in the in the months before or the weeks before that, that period of time where the sickness came upon you and and you know you lay there your bed and i remember many nights telling the lord lord you know jesus if if what i did before wasn't real mm. lord i come to you tonight i give you my heart and i did that so many times in my in my youth growing up i got saved maybe a hundred times <laughs> already and and because of the lack of understanding and the lack of assurance that comes with giving your heart to jesus it is a once and for all deal exactly. when you were born under sin and let's go back when adam fell it was a once and for all deal for the entire human race but when jesus came who the bible refers to as the last adam it was a once and for once all deal for all as well time. he paid for the sins of those who had gone before mm -hmm. the sins of those who were alive at that point in time and the sins of those who were yet to come and the thing about it is this i i say this to people when jesus died all of the sins that you were going to commit for those of you who are alive right now were in his future. Yeah, exactly. So we think sometimes that Jesus died for our sins went up to the point where we get saved. But then after we get saved and we commit sin, those sins now we have to do something special about those because they came after we came to Christ. But when we accepted Jesus, all of the sins we had done before that time took place after the cross. Exactly. So they, they were all in his future. So it means the ones that we committed in our past, the ones that we still do today when we met, when we when we fall short of the glory, and the ones that we will still do later on have all been covered by the blood of Jesus already. And that's how we can know that our salvation is assured. And I think a lot of people don't really are not really confident about their salvation because you know one of the things that we do if if today we sin mm -hmm. or we make a mistake, what do we normally do? We go back to all the other things that we have done before that we were quote unquote forgiven of and, and we, bring them all and back again and we bring them all back bring again. them all back again and repent of that whole fresh bag right. again so of it, sin it really makes the whole thing of that Jesus Christ has done for us when it's put that way it makes it look as though it's very the light. work of Jesus was not my big word that I love to use that it was not efficacious enough hmm. It wasn't. It wasn't efficacious enough. So, but, so what it means to me then is that we figured that the work of Adam and the work of the devil outstripped the work of, of Jesus. Jesus. Well, that's not the Lord's Jesus to the level of some sort of sheep or bull or or dove because the doves, you know, you had to you need or the, the 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 sacrifice for sin back under the Old Testament. You had to do that at least once a year. But Jesus did it once and for once all. And for all. But yet, still, somehow, we don't seem to believe that when we have accepted that sacrifice, that it works once mm. and for all. Right. We still figure we need to slaughter Jesus again, <laughs> again and, and again, again and again <laughs> and again. Actually, I want to just look here at Hebrews chapter one. Sorry, Hebrews chapter ten, verses one to ten. I think this is probably be the last scripture that we'll get in tonight. But. I just want to read these few scriptures here and assure all of those of you who are listening tonight, those who are not yet saved and those who are saved and struggling with the, 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 the truth of your salvation, struggling to know whether or not you are saved or not because you may have made some mistakes or you may be struggling in a particular area of your life. Verse 1 says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, which are the bulls and the goats and so on, and the sheep and all that, which were offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So the law could not make anyone perfect. For then would they not have ceased to would they not have ceased to be offered? That's a question. They're asking if those things could have made us perfect, would they have stopped offering them? Would it one have been enough? But verse continuing because that the worshippers once purged should have no more right. conscience right. of sin. You see that word right. conscience? Yeah. That is our number one issue in the body of Christ today. The conscience of sin. Sin, yeah. sin yeah. consciousness. Mm -hmm. We preach more sin out of our pulpits than any other topic on the face of the planet. And we come into church Sunday after Sunday and remind the people of sin, remind the people of fornication and adultery and of robbery and of this and of that and the third without reminding them that they have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. I'll tell you a little something here, Dad, which you know already. 
You don't have to tell some person when they've done something wrong. No. They know already. Exactly. You innately know by your conscience when you have done something wrong because you're not comfortable. Nobody is comfortable doing wrong. Even people who've been practicing wrong for a long time know that they are doing wrong. If not, they won't hide out and do it. Or they won't have to make such a big open show of it to, to, to pretend as though they're confident about it because they know that it is wrong. So, if these sacrifices could have done something, then the worshippers would have their consciences purged of sin. But verse 3 says, in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sin every year. So what the sacrifices were actually doing was they were reminding you that you have sin. Right. That's what they were doing. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he comes into the world... He now we're going to see his this 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 Jesus that we spoke of last week this grace when he comes into the world he says sacrifice and offering you would not but a body you have prepared for me talking to his father in heaven in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. God wasn't pleased with this sort of thing. God wasn't looking for all this blood to be flowing in the street bulls and sheep and and doves and all that but then it says in verse 7, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Now what was the will of God? Above when he said, Sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you would not, neither had pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He said, He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. So he takes away the first, which was the first covenant, or the old covenant, and he establishes a new, or a better, or a second covenant. Verse 10, which is the, the verse that I want us to remember tonight, By the which will we are sanctified, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, and listen to these last three words, right. once for all. all. Let me say that again. By the which we, by the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So Jesus doesn't have to die.